Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, and especially dear Ben, dear Don, and the whole Ferenc family, thank you for joining us today for this special event honoring Ben Ferenc on the occasion of his 101st birthday. A warm welcome from Nuremberg on behalf of the International Nuremberg Principals Academy. My name is Vivian Dietrich. My virtual background today is courtroom 600 the very courtroom where the Nuremberg trials took place more than 75 years ago and where Ben Ferenc made history as chief prosecutor of the Einsatzgruppen case. Of course, I would like to start with a resounding happy, happy birthday, dear Ben. I know you were watching and we are looking forward to seeing you live on screen in a short while. It's really terrific that you're able to be with us today. True delight. In the next hour, we will first present some selected photo impressions and video clips of Ben, featuring a conversation that was specially recorded for this event. Then I'm delighted that we will be joined by special guests who will share some personal reflections and birthday wishes for Ben. Today, I am joined by six special guests whom I'd like to most warmly welcome. Dr. Navi Pillai, former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, former judge of the ICC and ICTR, and president of the Advisory Council of the Nuremberg Academy. Ambassador Christian Wenerweser, permanent representative of the Principality of Liechtenstein to the United Nations. Fatou Ben Souda, prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. Professor Klaus Kress, Director of the Institute for International Peace and Security Law at the University of Cologne. Elisabeth Kaul, a close friend of the Ferenc family, and Klaus Rackwitz, Director of the International Nuremberg Principals Academy. We are delighted you all immediately accepted our invitation and are joining us today. Many, many thanks. It truly means a lot to us and it is a real privilege and pleasure to be in such distinguished company. Judge Thomas Bürgenthal unfortunately is not able to join us for the event today. I would like to say also a special thank you to the Nuremberg Academy team for supporting the event today, especially to Evelyn and Frauke and Mary behind the scenes. This event is also being recorded. Ben Ferenc, of course, needs no formal introduction, and yet I wish to say just a few words to savour his lifetime achievements today. In his most recent publication, Parting Words, Nine Lessons for a Remarkable Life. He shares his remarkable life story and he boils it down to nine lessons he has learned reflecting on a century of lifetime experience. Speaking of the book, in the description it asks the following spot on question. How many people do you know who grew up as a poor immigrant in America during the Great Depression, won a scholarship to Harvard Law School, landed on the beaches of Normandy on D-Day, were present at the liberation of concentration camps, including Buchenwald, Mauthausen and Flossenburg, held leading Nazis to account at the Nuremberg trials and have fought for an international criminal court to hold war criminals to account the world over. Indeed, Ben is a living legend and a champion of human rights and human dignity. As you all know, Ben is the last living prosecutor of the Nuremberg trials. Moved by the horrors of the Holocaust and the Second World War, Ben has continued to push the international community to uphold the rule of law and to fight impunity for international crimes. The passionate dedication to the Nuremberg principles tirelessly expressed in his slogan, law, not war, has shaped his long career. After the end of the Nuremberg trials, he worked for many years for victims associations of Holocaust survivors. For decades, he was a tireless advocate of the idea and the creation of a permanent international criminal court with worldwide jurisdiction to punish genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity and the crime of aggression. Of course, there are many iconic moments of Ben speaking at the Rome conference, of him closing the Lubanga case, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that shortly. The website launched a year ago on Ben's 100th birthday, www.benfrench.org, is indeed a treasure trove of access to his tremendous achievements, prolific writings, and extensive materials. 
For those joining us from near and far on this special occasion to honor Ben, I would like to warmly welcome you all again. We have been pleased to see such a tremendous positive echo of our initiative to jointly celebrate Ben today, and we are humbled by the assembled expertise and experience in the audience. We have participants from across the world, international and national experts, judges, prosecutors, lawyers, officials from international courts and tribunals, international organizations, government, civil society, and many scholars and students are with us here today. Thank you for joining us. In the next half hour, we will present a compilation of photo impressions and videos of Ben. All these photographs show a connection to Nuremberg and or the Nuremberg Academy. The photos are largely in chronological order, beginning with Ben's professional and personal connection to Nuremberg. Indeed, all four of his children were born in Nuremberg. I'd like to say a particular thanks to his son, Don, for providing us with some private photos of the Ferenc family for this special occasion. The last photo shown is from 2021, showing a bronze bust of Ben that was officially only introduced to the public today. So thanks to the Memoriam Nuremberg Trials for sharing a photo of this bust in its new home in Nuremberg. You will also see two photos, uh, sorry, two videos. First, a video message of Ben specially recorded for the Nuremberg Forum 2018, dedicated to 20th anniversary of the Rome Statute. And second, a recorded conversation that has only been lightly edited that I had the great pleasure of conducting with Ben just a few days ago. Enjoy. Greetings to you all. Some of you will recognize me as Ben Ferenz. I'm speaking to you now from Delray Beach, Florida in October 2018. I'm delighted to be welcomed by Director Rakwitz and the other old friends who will be in your audience. I'm sorry that I cannot join you. I am now in my 99th year and I'm trying to limit my travels. But I wanted to take the opportunity to pick on the few points which I think are relevant at this time of celebrating the 20th anniversary of the creation of the International Criminal Court. My plans go back to the first Nuremberg trials and Justice Jackson and the hopes of everyone that we would have a more peaceful world governed by law. The subsequent proceedings in which I had the honor of prosecuting the Einsatzgruppen for the biggest murder trial in human history, for the murder of over a million people, mostly Jews, uh, where I made the argument that we must have a more humane and peaceful world. We must have new values to substitute for settling disputes by war. It's gotten to be much too dangerous. We now have the capacity from cyberspace to cut off the electrical grid on planet Earth. That means that when heads of state are unable to agree, they send their young people out to kill other young people. When they get tired of killing each other, they go home and rest for a little bit, then they start again. That's the current system. It cannot continue because there'll be no life left on Earth if they ever let loose, not only with the nuclear weapons, but with the uh, cyberspace weapons, which are now costing billions of dollars, instead of using the money to care for the legitimate complaints of people who are suffering throughout the world, they use it to build more weapons to kill more people. We are in the hands of a government which does not think rationally on this problem. We have, for example, John Bolton, who is now the leading advisor to the President of the United States on these problems. He's the one who, when the United States signed the statue for the ICC sent their ambassador David Sheffer down on a stormy day in the last day of the year to sign for the United States. It was reversed by 
John Bolton, who went in and said, no, signature of the United States president does not count. That's outrageous. In a speech which he just made recently in September to the Federalists, a very conservative group in Washington, he said the ICC will never support it. The ICC is dying and it is dead, is what he said. The ICC is dead. The ICC has many problems. It's still sick, but the ICC is there and it was a prototype. And uh, it will improve with time. It is improving with time. Um, they have excellent staff doing a very difficult, perhaps impossible job. But one day, this will follow the path of the bicycle. They said a bicycle couldn't fly. Well, we got a thousand planes in the air. One day we will recognize that law of war is a better way to go. I recall my Supreme Commander, Justice uh, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, as President of the United States, who warned the world, he said, the world can no longer turn to war. If civilization is to survive, it must choose the rule of law. Make your choice. Who do you follow? Dwight D. Eisenhower, President, or you follow John Bolton, who would destroy you all? I think his prediction that the ICC is already dead is not true. I think John Bolton will be dead before the ICC is dead. So you are the ones who built it. You are the ones who carried on. I'm now approaching my 100th year, and uh, I think my days may be numbered, but I have learned that you must substitute compassion and compromise as the tools to reach agreement. And I use my slogan, law, not war. And I have three pieces of advice. One, never give up. Two, never give up. Three, you said it, never give up. Good luck to all of you and all my best wishes. Thank you very much. Speaking of Nuremberg, you have experienced courtroom 600 and the Nuremberg trials as few other people. When you think of courtroom 600 today, what does it invoke in you? It invokes in me the position taken by the defendants. They are all pleaded not guilty. Not a one expressed any regret. And when they were all convicted and the judges came in the next day with the sentences, uh, the room was quiet. The judges began individual by individual. Dr. Otto Oldorf, he stood up in front of the court and the presiding judge, Michael Mosmano, said for the crimes of which you have been convicted, this tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Silence in the courtroom, he would bow, step back, and disappear into the lift, which dropped him back from once he came right under the courthouse. The next defendant, for the crimes of which you've been convicted, you are sentenced to death by hanging. The next one, death by hanging, death by hanging, death by hanging, death by hanging. And each time there was death by hanging, my head just went like that. And uh, so if you ask me the one event in the course of that trial, which has remained with me, okay. uh, has been just these death sentences, 13 of them in a row. And I hadn't asked for any death penalty at all. I had only asked for a new rule of law to protect all of humanity from that type of cruel treatment. But I hadn't suggested sentences. And the sentences were more severe, in fact, than I had expected. As you know, the fight against impunity that is symbolized by courtroom 600 today is being conducted all over the world um, in international tribunals, hybrid courts, or national jurisdictions. 
What is your message to those practitioners involved in judicial processes today? My message is have courage despite the opposition which exists in some quarters. Nuremberg put humanity on the right track a rule of law to prohibit and deter people from behaving like wild animals as they did. And uh, to get that message across to a, an audience, part of which is not receptive, is not easy. And uh, I continue doing that because I can't give up. And the advice I give to everybody else is never give up. You're on the right track. Law, not war. If any of you hearing this thinks that war is better than law, they should have your head examined before it's blown off your head. Uh, and uh, that message of law is better than war leaves us with no real options. Either the people settle it by peaceful means between themselves, or they turn to a third party, a court, to hear the evidence and fairly try to reach a just decision. And uh, that is what we have been working on all these years. And it's very difficult to do. And I need help from all the young people because after 102, I don't know how much longer I continue waving this banner. And I look to you to pick up the banner and walk with it. And if you can't walk with it, run with it. If you can't run with it, crawl with it. Whatever you do, know that you're on the right track and don't let anybody stop you. In your view, what is the most important quality that a prosecutor and a judge should have when involved in international crime cases? Well, it was always very clear to the American side, in fact, that there should be a fair trial. The Russians said, what do you need a fair trial for? We know they, they murdered millions of our people. They shut down prisoners of war in, in tour and chains who had surrendered. And they killed them. And we know it. We saw it. What do you need a fair trial for? Is this trial enough? And the Americans said, no, uh, everybody is presumed innocent until found guilty in a fair court of law. And uh, we insisted upon the trials. Uh, the British were a little skeptical, too, and the French also. But it was the Americans who insisted upon fair trials. And uh, in retrospect, despite some of the defects, I still am convinced that was the right decision. And uh, that's what we've been doing ever since we're trying. The qualities which a, an, a prosecutor must have in all cases is to be objective. Don't go in there with uh, an assured conviction. Of course, you have to believe it. The person you're putting on trial is guilty of a crime. I don't mean you should go about and suggest the uh, rest of people on the streets, but uh, you should be prepared to hear the defense and give him every opportunity to make every rational argument to prove his own innocence. So that is the basic quality of a prosecutor, to be fair, and to be fair to the defendant, even though I may be convicted, uh, convinced, that he's committed terrible crimes, let the jurors make that decision or the judges make that decision. So how crucial was the establishment of a permanent international criminal court for the securing of the legacy of the Nuremberg principles? It was vital. Uh, there was no international criminal court until the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg was set up. There were no such thing as an international criminal court. And uh, I recognized immediately that uh, international crimes were being committed in different parts of the world. And if we don't have a court to deter those crimes by holding the perpetrators to account in a fair trial in a court of law, then we're helpless. The, the madmen will take over. And uh, so I consider that a vital component in the evolution of a more humane way of dealing with terribly violent crimes. 
Over the years, through your distinguished yeah. career and activism, you experienced the Nuremberg trials firsthand, but also you've interacted with many survivors of mass atrocities. Yeah. How have these exchanges influenced you and what is your message to policymakers today? My approach from the beginning was you have to proceed step by step. This is a complicated problem. It has never been dealt with in the world before, where you take mass murders and put them on a public trial. But the trial is only the beginning. That's the first step. The objective is to deter people from committing the same crime again. So you need, after the trial, you need an effective system of enforcement of the judgments. First, you need clarification of what the rules are. For that, you have to have a court or lawyers or professors defining what will be acceptable and what is not acceptable uh, in civilized society. Then you need a court to decide who has committed those violations. And then you need a system of effective enforcement. We have made good progress on defining what is permissible and not permissible. Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for example, is only one example. This has appeared also in many domestic jurisdictions. So, and we have the beginning of courts as well. We have the International Military Tribunal. We have now the International Court of Justice in The Hague. But on enforcement arm, we're not doing anything. We're relying upon newspaper stories or public or personal action, vengeance. It's the worst thing you can do. Um, and uh, so we are in a process of an evolutionary process of reaching out to a more civilized type of behavior. There have been ups and downs. Uh, sometimes the downs seem to be overcoming the ups, uh, but we mustn't be discouraged because it's a difficult and a long drawn out process. For centuries, we have glorified lawmaking, killing your neighbors who you don't agree with. Centuries long glorification. And along comes this little kid from Romania, and he says, hold on, hold on. You can't do that. That's inhumane. People are entitled to be treated as human beings, not like dead animals. And to have that accepted, it is accepted in many quarters already. We do have the international court. It is functioning. It, it has its detractors. Of course it has. You couldn't expect it to be otherwise. But the fact that it's there, and the fact that it's beginning, and the fact that it's beginning to improve, and the fact that everybody now recognizes or should recognize that we don't just go out and kill the guy because you don't like him. Uh, you have to take him to a court if he's doing something wrong. So that's been the process. You have spoken on how the glorification of war making that you just invoked, um, namely the capacity to kill human beings has grown faster than our capacity to meet their urgent and vital and justified needs. Given the pressing challenges of today's interconnected and highly technologically dominated world, how can this pattern that you're so concerned about and we all are be reversed? I want word answer is slowly. You can't expect us to reverse overnight what has been glorified in all countries. The flag is flying, nationalism overall. My church is the only true church. Kill your enemy if you have an enemy. If you have the power, use it. That has been the philosophy since I can remember and even before. But we are slowly, slowly moving away from that. We have the courts, we have the principles, we have declarations of human rights, we have human rights organizations of various kinds. They must not be discouraged by the fact that it's difficult. First of all, it's important to remember, don't look for perfection. You're never going to eliminate all people from committing all crimes. Don't expect perfection. If you're making progress, that's about the best you can really do. And we are making progress. And I am optimistic, not pessimistic. I think I'm more realistic than either one uh, to see how difficult it is to have people change their way of thinking about other things, which they hold dear, their country, their God, whatever it is, their economic circumstance. 
So the answer really to your question is it's, it takes a while and a while more than one human life. I've spent practically all of my life trying to get people to accept what I've been telling you here. And there has been a large acceptance, the very fact that I can be here on television and large numbers of people will hear it and many of them will agree with me. It didn't exist before. Before it was only you, you against the enemy and then you try to kill him and he tried to kill you. And uh, there was no consequence except a lot of dead people. So don't give up. Keep going. You're in the right, on the right track. In light of contested multilateralism and the erosion of the rule of law worldwide, what is necessary in your view for the effective prevention of atrocities and accountability efforts in the upholding of a rules-based international order? It's very hard to get people to change their minds on something which they have glorified for centuries and you tell them, no, it's, you can't do that anymore. It's not nice. It's, it's naughty, uh, whatever. And uh, uh, if you realize at the outset that you cannot be fully successful, that everybody's going to go home and say, well, now we're not going to discriminate against blacks anymore. We're not going to persecute and murder all the Jews anymore. We're going to treat everybody fairly and so on. Uh, more and more people are beginning to feel that way. They are not yet a majority, I would think, in many places. But nevertheless, uh, the progress is definitely there. This pro program and your institute, which exists, didn't exist before. No one would have thought it's possible. No one thought it would, would do anything good. You couldn't have proposed it in thin air. Perhaps we had to pay with these lives in order to get people to pay attention. Um, but now they're paying attention. Not all people. Some people prefer, we have the power, use it. And if he's your enemy, kill him. This is a philosophy and uh, a realistic philosophy, they would say. I repudiate that philosophy. That's a suicide prophecy. And uh, as we increase our capacity to kill people, it gets even more dangerous all the time. We, our danger today is not so much the tanks and the guns and the artillery with which I was a part of during the war. Uh, and it's not even the nuclear weapons. We go to cyberspace. And when I first learned about cyberspace, it was in a meeting of concerned citizens from different parts of the world, meeting in St. Petersburg, Russia. And the only Americans there were myself and an American general from the Pentagon. And we had breakfast and uh, uh, I said, what are you up to now, general? He said, I'm, I'm working on the cyberspace problem. I didn't know what he was talking about. I said, what's the cyberspace problem? He said, well, you know, and he looked around at restaurant, was a hotel restaurant. And he said, uh, well, uh, you know, we have a capacity today from cyberspace to destroy the uh, electric grid on planet Earth. I didn't know what he was talking about. I destroy the electrical grid on planet Earth. He said, yes. I said, well, what's the effect of that? The lights go out, it's water does run, the hospitals can't function. Uh, how long do you think people could survive that? And he kind of looked around and he said, well, it might depend upon how much water they had. If they had enough water, they probably could survive for about a week. And I was just stunned. Uh, a week, and they kill everybody in the planet Earth, or I'm sure also on parts of the planet. If they can kill the whole planet, they certainly can target a city or a country. Uh, and uh, it was then very secret, top secret. I couldn't talk about it. I didn't talk about it until now. It's gotten to be pretty much public knowledge. The magazine articles and books are, are talking about cyberspace. And so I tell the young people, hey, kids, I'm not worried about my life. I'm going to be 102 years old. I'm worried about your life. Your life is in greater danger now than it ever has been. In my life, we were fearing tanks, and then we were fearing airplanes, and then we were fearing 
nuclear weapons, all of which are obsolete today. You face total destruction if you don't decide to settle your disputes and differences by peaceful means only, not violent means. And peaceful means only is what's prescribed in the United Nations Charter after about 50 billion people were killed in war. Uh, how much more do you have to kill? And anyway, uh, that gives you a notion of where I'm coming from. Ten years ago, you wrote, paraphrasing Telford Taylor, about, quote, the lessons we undertook to teach at Nuremberg. You concluded that piece by stating that there is cause for hope. In that regard, when you look at the world of today, what makes you hopeful? What makes you optimistic or gives you hope that law will prevail over war? Well, the most obvious one today is the fact that a president who didn't believe in that uh, is no longer in office. He has been voted out of office. And uh, that's an encouraging sign. Uh, it's, I heard Adolf Hitler say, Deutschland über alles, Germany over alles. I heard American president say, make America great again. Ha, huh. you don't become great by killing your adversary and by refusing to admit them in because you think they're all a bunch of drug pushers or you pretend they are or you don't let them advance because of the color of their skin. That is ending slowly and we must not give up hope and we must not give up trying because it takes so long. It takes a long time, but we have had the opposite for centuries. So don't give up now. We're on the verge of either killing everybody, which doesn't include me, I'm going by, but or inventing and applying a more humane and peaceful philosophy. On the occasion of your 101st birthday, what would be your message of inspiration, of hope to young people around the world watching today who desire to do service for the cause of law, not war? I have boil things down to make it simple to understand. Three words, law, not war. If you think that war is better than law, then you can shut off this program and go put yourself in an insane asylum. Then you're plain crazy. Uh, so people are beginning to recognize it. And we must not get impatient with that. And we must never give up, never give up, never give up. That goes... It's my slogan of the three things to do. If you persist, and if you're lucky, uh, and you have control and are not voted out of office, uh, or forget that vengeance is not our goal. I made that point in the opening paragraph of the Einsatz Group in case. I said vengeance is not our goal. We seek to uh, obtain a rule of law which will protect all human beings from the type of action was the Einsatz group and trial displayed, killing thousands of children because they were Jews and rounding them up and killing them just because of their color and so on. Uh, that time will have to pass. It is slowly passing. We must never give up and uh, we must see clearly our goals. And uh, law is better than law no matter what you say. And uh, law means a humane system which can be enforced through the judicial process. Without the courts, you have no law. So you, you must think of together, hand in hand. But when you see the total picture of law and courts and enforcement and the necessity for all those components and the progress that we have made in my lifetime, it's a long life, but I've seen the problems and I recognize the problems and I keep going. I never give up. <laughs> I never give up. <laughs> I don't know how long I can carry on, but never give up is my advice. Thank you for being such an inspiration to young people and to all of us, frankly. Your passion is palpable and your energy is, is purely infectious. So once again, heartfelt thank you, dearest Ben. 
It was complete privilege speaking to you and truly inspiring listening to you. And also I'd like to thank again your son Don for all the magic making for the recently recorded conversation and making this event happen also. Now it is my distinct pleasure to invite our special guests to join me on this special occasion. Fatou Ben Souda, Navi Pillai, Elisabeth Kaul, Christian Venaveza, Klaus Kress and Klaus Rackwitz. I'm very much looking forward to your personal reflections and birthday wishes to Ben for a few minutes each. Given Ben's professional and personal connection to Nuremberg, first let me turn to Klaus Rackwitz, who is joining us from Nuremberg. Over to you, Klaus. Thank you very much, Vivian. And let me join you in your heartfelt congratulations. Uh, it's a pleasure and a true privilege for the Academy uh, to host this event today in honor of Ben French. But personally, I met Ben for the first time at the swearing in of the first prosecutor of the ICC in June 2003. And it was absolutely fascinating. A man in his age being so thrilled, so joyful, so full of hope and energy, seeing that after 50, more than 50 years of his own uh, action as a prosecutor, a prosecutor of an international criminal court uh, was uh, sworn in. And uh, that is a court for which Ben has been tirelessly not lobbying, he has been fighting for it for many, many years. So it was, so it was fascinating to see this energy in this man. It was also fascinating to see how the young colleagues actually listened to him and uh, were seeking the dialogue with him. And then later I had uh, the privilege of uh, watching, uh, and I have the picture still in front of me, uh, Ben uh, appearing uh, before uh, the bench uh, in the International Criminal Court on the occasion of the closing arguments in the Lubanga case. And I do know that some people called to criticize this as a show effect. Well, it was far away from that. And uh, whoever is in doubt, my advice would be just look at the face of the presiding judge at the end of Ben's submission. Oh yes, he made an impact. And uh, uh, it is not uh, that Ben has lost any of his passion uh, for international justice. And the last time I had the pleasure to see him personally he was on the inauguration of the bench, his generous gift to the city of uh, The Hague. And uh, we just saw him sitting on that bench a minute ago in the video. A happy man who has given so much, so much to all of us. There's a popular German author, Heinrich Spörl, and he describes in one of his uh, books the prosecution as the cavalry of justice. It's surrounded by uh, the frosty breath of their work. Well, Ben is anything but frosty. I've hardly met somebody who is so warm, so friendly, so modest, and has such a nice sense of humor. Dear Ben, I can only thank you very, very much for all you did for international justice, for the victims which have been in your focus for many, many years. And I wish you all the very best uh, for the next many years, hopefully, continued health and happiness for many, many years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Klaus. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn to Dr. Navi Pillai, who is joining us from Durban for a message in her personal capacity and as president of the Advisory Council of the Nuremberg Academy. Over to you, Navi. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Ben, and a very happy birthday to you. Um, I'm going to first say a few words in my capacity as president of the, Nure uh, the council, the advisory council of the Nuremberg Principals Academy. I succeeded Thomas Bergenthal as the president and I'm sure that he will want me to greet you in his name as well because he was supposed to speak ahead of me and could not make it. So on behalf of Tom, as well as all my fellow members of the Advisory Council of Nuremberg Principals Academy. Let me congratulate you on your life's work and to say to you, do you see what we are doing? We're keeping your work alive. You were one of the first individual, but certainly the, the, the one and only surviving individual who directly promoted the Nuremberg Principles, in fact, created them. So what the Academy is doing is keeping that alive, popularizing the Nuremberg principles. So this is a very important institution and one of its goals is really 
to continue the legacy that you are leaving uh, for international criminal justice. Now, from my personal le level, let me say that um, we first met in Guatemala. In fact, you reminded me that we met there. You think that being slightly younger than you that I would remember, but you did. So what were we doing in Guatemala? It was uh, a room full of military as well as activists from outside and very, very crushed and timid uh, local activists. And we were promoting the idea of a tribunal, a hybrid tribunal in Guatemala or an international a tribunal, and I uh, shared that message as well. Uh, I was very diplomatic, but there was Ben, who literally pointing that finger of his that we saw uh, in, in the video, pointing that finger towards who? All the military sitting in that room. You know, it was just a transition period. These people were still in power. But Ben was not afraid. He said, some of you may have to stand trial for atrocities committed here. So a truly inspiring figure, Ben. You know, I was um, 18 or so, and unusually I read the new, some of the Nuremberg uh, cases because I was uh, suffering as a law student and later a lawyer in apartheid South Africa. And, and we owe to you the fact that you did this precedential matter of bringing perpetrators to justice in an international forum, the world's first. And I was particularly intrigued as well that you put in not only military leaders, but politicians and judges uh, on trial. So thank you for that work because it inspired me from a very young age. After Guatemala, I uh, met you later at your home in New Rochelle where you kindly invited me to have breakfast. I came in with my daughter, she's rather attractive. So I don't mind telling on you, Ben. You just stopped total, you stopped interest in me, you didn't look at me, you focused all the time on my attractive daughter. So there you are, the twinkle in your eye, the joy of living, but above all, you're a teacher. And you went around explaining some of your publications and your photographs to my daughter. And I realized why your students love you. And you, you were not only interesting, you were interested in me and her and what we were doing. Now, that's an unusual characteristic, to be so generous with your time and, and, and caring for others. And of course, you have such a fine sense of humor but I do have to tell you, there is one person who beats you in that uh, sense of humor. And that's your son, Don, who came, who came to see me in Arusha, where I was the president. He should have been scared of me. No, there he was, teasing, pulling my leg, and so on. So father and son, a great pair. I always remember, of course, the inauguration. I was one of the first 18 judges to be inaugurated at the ICC in The Hague. And you will remember it was such a stormy day. Where was Ben Ferenc? He was on the beaches of Skeveningen and really there were gale force winds there. Some activists had, put, had uh, built sand castles and put the various country flags on, the countries of states that had ratified the Rome Statute. But of course, the United States had not. And Ben did a single uh, championship of, one, of, of a sandcastle and he stuck in the US flag there because he was so confident that one day the US will join that court. So I do remember that courageous step as well. So thank you for all your work, Ben. You know, these are precedents you helped create and I, respect them in, in my capacity as an international judge as well. It's always useful when somebody else has done the first frontline work. So many thanks to you. Uh, you are an inspiration. And as I say, the Nuremberg Principles Academy will continue to popularize the work of the Nuremberg trials. Thank you. Many thanks, Navi, for your warm words. Thank you.
And now to Ambassador Christian Winnerweser, who is joining us from New York. Thank you so much, uh, Viviane, for, in, for including me uh, in this very happy moment to pay tribute to an exceptional person and to honor uh, a uniquely productive and inspired um, life. So it's really great to be here. Ben, you are an icon of international criminal justice. You are the icon of international criminal justice. You have been a mentor and teacher to numerous people, including myself, and you are, I'm proud to say, a friend. Um, we have looked back quickly um, at your uniquely uh, rich life, and I was thinking, and have been thinking that before, what do you do if you are prosecutor in Nuremberg before you turn 30? Where do you have to go after that? It turned out, in your case, you had a lot of places to go, and you turned yourself into really the embodiment of the idea of the rule of law, if I can think of one person on this planet that encapsulates the notion of the rule of law, it is, it is you, um, Ben. Um, you have not only taught people what you think is important, and you have this unique ability to capture that in very few words. And very often you have said, never give up, never give up, never give up. And you have in fact lived that. You did not give up in particular in Rome at the crucial moment when it was about including the crime of aggression in the Rome statute. It was because of you and it was because of Hans-Peter Kahl that we ended up with this provision. You have made a unique contribution to the creation of the International Criminal Court and very simply Without you, there would not be international law uh, making the use of force and the crime of aggression illegal. That is a unique achievement. Of course, I am very proud and honored to have played my role in this with you. And this has, of course, defined our relationship. You sat with us through what you, I think, thought were very tedious discussions in uh, Princeton at the end of which he usually gave us a, a pep talk, which to some people amounted to a, a dressing down and explained to us that things were much easier and simpler than we um, all thought. And I remember the many conversations that we had in Princeton and the many lunches you treated me to at the Harvard Club, where we always had very inspired um, exchanges. And you have been such an inspiration to me in particular in your imperative, um, never um, give up. So congratulations to you, Ben. All the best, best of health. I know you're vaccinated. I very much look forward to seeing you again. Thank you for being a friend to this day. And thank you also for being a really fun person to be around. We have laughed so often together. And your sense of humor is one of your amazing qualities. And I'm glad that it didn't get you more into trouble than it actually did in your life. So all the best to you, Ben. I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much, Christian. Thank you. Now, Prosecutor Ben Suda, joining us from The Hague, I'd like to invite you for your personal reflections. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues at the Nuremberg Academy for this very thoughtful initiative. And of course, the uh, gracious invitation. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here with all of you today to honor a man I feel privileged to call a personal friend and someone who has been an inspiration to me and, and indeed to millions around the world. Uh, in life, there are those who lead by their example those whose contagious optimism and sense of purpose bring the seemingly impossible within reach. Those who make us believe again in the goodness of humanity and let us hope, let us have hope for its future. Indeed, those who by their very passion defy the laws of nature 
and do not let age stand in the way of their destiny to do good in the world. Where good and leadership, we all know, are in dire need. As you know, Ben, you signify all these things to me. And as we celebrate your birthday, Ben, I would like to acknowledge in this setting that thanks to you, we know what genuine commitment to the cause of international criminal justice really means and how one person alone can achieve having been witness to dark lessons of history and equipped with a genuine commitment to never again repeat the horrors of the past through the powerful instrument we call law and the rule of law. You're prosecuting, your work prosecuting the evil behind the machinations of the Holocaust played a crucial role in the establishment of the ICC and has inspired my own work at the ICC to strive for a measure of justice for victims of atrocity crimes, no matter who the perpetrator. And as I undertake my duties without fear or favor in your footsteps and face the consequences of that principal commitment to the cause of justice, I have always taken guidance and comfort from the words you once mentioned to me. And I quote those words. You said to me, Ben, it takes courage not to be discouraged. I take courage from those words and your friendship, Ben. Today, we are in the esteemed company of a truly, truly iconic trendsetter. And we celebrate his birthday where a hundred years ago, the creator smiled on humanity and said, let there be Benjamin Beryl Ferenc. My every day, may every day be Ben Ferenc day so that we can celebrate his life's achievements and be guided by his eternal message of law, not war. Ben, you are a man to whom humanity owes a debt of gratitude. So I would say many happy returns, my dear friend, and thank you. Thank you all for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Fatou. Thank you for sharing those wonderful words. Now I'd like to turn to Elisabeth Kowal. Um, over to you from Berlin, I believe you're joining us from. Dear Ben, congratulations. Let us briefly go back to the summer of 1998 in Rome. My husband Hans-Peter came home as exhausted as happy and counting his blessings that he met you as an inspiration personally as a mentor and ally professionally, as a ray of hope internationally. And last but not least, you granted him your friendship, Ben. There are countless wonderful memories, but I have some favorites. I remember a conference in Chautauqua in 2010. As always, there was an entourage of eager young academics around you. On one occasion, Two of them reached out for your arms to help you down the stairs, but were they mistaken? You swiftly threw your folder to your son Don, and now, with your hands free, you spontaneously performed a headstand. You, a young man of 90 years then. Ben, one of the pillars of your life I had the privilege to witness firsthand, the love between you and your wife Gertrude, one of my role models, in her courage and above all in her love. From the very first time we met you together to the very last time we waved you goodbye at Union Station in New York, you were always walking hand in hand. Ben, I being a German, all Germans owe you so much for speaking justice in Nuremberg, confronted with the worst atrocities. That gave my generation the possibility to grow up in a country that was enabled to join the international community and my beloved husband to be among the first 18 judges of the ICC. Now, begin again so often, uh, I, I being so often in Den Haag again to see my grandchildren there. I take them to the Ben Bench 
in front of the Peace Palace. One day they will be able to read law, not war. And until then, I will remind them, never give up, never give up. With love from Berlin to all Ferencians. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thank you for your warm personal words. Now, last but certainly not least, I'd like to turn to Professor Klaus Kress, who is joining us from Cologne. The floor is yours. Thank you, Viviane. Happy birthday, dear Ben. This is such a wonderful opportunity to say thank you. Since I first met you at the Rome conference, you have been inspiring my work. Thank you for this precious gift. Thank you also as a German citizen. You have helped confronting Germany with the darkest part of its history, with the most horrible crimes committed under its name. You have then contributed to the wonderful miracle that today flourishing Jewish communities are again greatly enriching cultural life in Germany. And together with your dear friend, the late judge Hans-Peter Kaul, you have also helped the official Germany to fully endorse the Nuremberg legacy and to become a supporter of international criminal justice. Most importantly, thank you, Ben, for what you have done for the international community as a whole. For decades, you have been working tirelessly with an incredible amount of dedication and determination in the spirit of Robert Jackson's fundamental promise to fully universalize the Nuremberg precedent in order to strengthen the most fundamental rules of the international legal order. At your 101st birthday, you can note with great satisfaction the establishment of the first permanent international criminal court in legal history and the recent activation of this court's jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. Two high points and you have decisively contributed to both of them. One birthday wish for you is that this tremendous normative and institutional progress will be safeguarded against powerful resistance and brought to fuller life in practice. In that respect, how wonderful would it be if the United States of America under its new administration would again be guided by your spirit and make courageous moves towards fully embracing the Nuremberg promise of both an effective and a non-selective application of international criminal law. And what could be achieved in the same vein if all those concerned would be captured by your inspiration? For those who apply international criminal law, you stand as a model for the professional integrity that is needed. For scholars, you provide a shining example of a critical, though always constructive mind. And for states, one of your key messages is that the support for international criminal law as for international law in general, counts most not in festive speeches, but whenever it risks to be uncomfortable politically. A more personal birthday wish for you is this. May there be many more occasions for you to enjoy in good health, engaging with the young people your love and affection for the youth are absolutely extraordinary. And the responses are accordingly. At this happy occasion, we wish to provide you with a beautiful recent example. 
My faculty, the School of Law at the University of Cologne has recently awarded you an honorary doctoral degree. At this occasion, you send us a wonderful message specifically directed to our students. And the students responded. They responded in a way so remarkable that we now wish to display this response for your enjoyment then and for the joy of all of us. Again, dear Ben, happy birthday. Studying law is indisputably tough. And while some of us might be in it for the money, spending nights at the kitchen table, pursuing only a well-paying, respectable position in a major law firm, certainly most of us are not. However, despite firmly believing this, we ever so often find ourselves at that table, buried in our textbooks, wondering why. If not for the money, we are doing this to ourselves, being sleepless at night and stressed out at day. The answer to that we find in you, Ben. It is the notion that law is a powerful tool in the hands of the right people. That it can certainly be more than just selling up contracts for money. That it might even be a way to find peace and real justice and reconciliation. This is what keeps us going, because it gives us a much needed sense of direction and shows us what kind of lawyers we want to be one day. You are a great role model to many students. And while few, likely none of us, will achieve what you have achieved, we all try to carry that torch you gave us as best as we can. With all these sparks carrying your vision of law and world peace into the future, surely we'll be able to keep the fire you lit burning bright and hopefully ignite new flames of our own one day. Thank you for your work, for what you've achieved for world history and for international law. But most of all, thank you for being our role model. We wish you all the best. What a wonderful note to end this homage to you, Ben. As the students highlighted, the young generation, the next generation indeed, feels inspired and is ready to carry the torch, to keep the fire you lit alive and to ignite sparks and flames of justice. Thank you very much to all our special guests who have joined us from three continents to come together to celebrate Ben today. You shared some precious stories, some memorable moments, and some personal memories of Ben as a brilliant lawyer, as a wonderful colleague, an extraordinary teacher, and a dear friend on this special occasion. Now I turn to our very special guest today, dear Ben. You have been a friend of the Nuremberg Academy since the beginning, and your engagement has been a constant source of inspiration and encouragement. You have been to Nuremberg on numerous occasions and we have benefited from your wisdom. Most recently, you penned a piece for the forthcoming anthology, The Past, Present and Future of the International Criminal Court, to be published in the Nuremberg Academy series later this year. And most fondly, I personally remember our last meeting in The Hague during the occasion of the bench inauguration in 2018. 
Now joining us from Florida, it gives me great joy to hand over to you directly, Ben. Once again, happy 101st birthday, dear Ben. To all of you, thank you. I am overwhelmed by uh, the generosity of your observations. I am encouraged to continue going on, if I could, for another 100 years, um, because it has not been in vain. And oftentimes, it was easy to be discouraged. And I said, as you quoted me, it takes courage not to be discouraged, but it's too dangerous to be discouraged. We live in a dangerous world still, and there are still many people who don't believe in law rather than war. So the hazard still exists, and it's because of people like you, all of each one of you, uh, that enables us to continue uh, without any total chaos. And uh, I do appreciate what each one of you have done to me, uh, and you have encouraged me. Uh, you have helped me in your own ways, each one of you. And you are part of my army of in civilian people who see a better world and a better possibility ahead of us and will never give up, never give up, never give up. So I would like to just mention in passing Elizabeth Cowell, who, uh, uh, who sent us her husband, uh, Hans Peter Cowell, who was the first German ambassador to come to the International Criminal Court. And we became fast friends with him and with his family, including Elizabeth. And my wife appreciates the role of the wife in keeping a good man going. So I want to thank her particularly at the outset that uh, I'm sorry I missed her in some of these meetings, but I look forward to seeing her again, not too far away. Now, we also have Navi Pillay, Judge Pillay, uh, who has also been a staunch uh, bearer of, of the message that we have. She accepted that as a human rights expert that I was on the right track and she joined to push that train forward. Christian Reynavesa has been our daily bread. The representative of Liechtenstein has been a stalwart supporter of everything that we have done. Uh, his staff has been done. I've met dozens of times in his office or at the Harvard Club saying what could be done next. And that has enabled me to continue going as well as the progress to be made. Uh, Fatou, of course, is a gem. Uh, she was sitting there when I made my closing remarks, invited as a non-employee of the organization. No one has ever paid me for any of this. I was invited to do the closing remarks for the first case of the International Criminal Tribunal. And uh, Fatou was sitting there, keeping an eye on me. And uh, we have remained friends ever since. And uh, she has had the courage, the real courage necessary to carry on defiant of the assaults which have been launched against her personally uh, by threats of uh, cutting off the budget and stuff like that. Uh, so it has taken courage, and she's had courage. And I tell her, never give up, to Never lose your courage. Uh, now we have now, who have we have? Klaus Kress. Uh, I was in Cologne when we gave an honorary doctorate to Hans Peter Kau some years ago. And uh, uh, I do appreciate the honor of having a German university give me a doctorate saying that uh, we also appreciate what you've done. I have made the point that uh, many times that war can make mass murderers out of otherwise decent people. And I've met very many very decent people. Some of them were mass murderers, like Dr. Otto Olmdorf, for example my lead defendant, who killed at least 75,000 Jews. And uh, I tried to 
not to console him, to hear some word of remorse from him when he was in the death house and remorse was lacking. And he was making an argument that the United States have made that we have the right in self-defense to uh, uh, preempt that and attack first. It's, the judge has said it's not a right. It's a ridiculous argument. And uh, I hope that argument will never be made by anyone. So uh, the Nuremberg Principles Academy is the important role with Vivian and Klaus are still carrying on and remain as a symbol, not only to go and sit on my bench, <laughs> which my son organized really, uh, in, in front of it, in the, in, the, in the view of the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice. It's a symbol. And uh, I hope many people sit on it, think about why it's there. So I wish I could go more into the detail of each of you to express my sincere appreciation for your putting this program together, which I think is a fantastic program. You have said everything that I have to say. If you'll take that and disseminate it as far and wide as you can, everybody will know where I stood and where I stand and where you stand and your organization. So I wish you good luck in disseminating that information because therein lies our future. If we ever give up, we're lost. And uh, so remember the fatal words, never give up, never give up, never give up. And that's how I got to be. Oh, I'm entering my 102nd year in a few days. I'll be 102 years old, beginning. Uh, and I don't give up because I have no time to give up. Uh, the job is still before us, but with your help, and the help of others so we will convince I'm confident we will not destroy the world. We will have a better world. So I thank all of you for the personal tribute. I thank you for all of your help that you've been giving me. I thank you and your children that they may carry on to a more humane and peaceful world. Thank you all very much. Wonderful that you were with us today. Dear Ben, once again, happy birthday and all good wishes and we'll remember to never give up. Thank you for shining such a bright light and leading by example. We wish you that you keep shining bright. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, your warmth and your wishes with us. Well, that concludes our event today. So I would like to once again thank our distinguished speakers and special guests who have contributed wonderful stories and truly exquisite memories and conversations with Ben. Thank you to everyone who has been with us, has been watching and joining us from around the world to celebrate Ben Ferenc and his life. We have been reminded indeed by Ben to never give up and to uphold the rule of law. I would like to end by honoring your legacy, Ben, and with your own words, law, not war. Thank you and goodbye.